Well, uh, good afternoon, um, everybody. Um, it's great to see you, of course, again. This is the highlight um, of the Institutes for Global Leadership, the highlight of our year, the International Epic Symposium, which uh, this year is focusing on problems without passports. And I'm just so delighted that we have the Honorable Margot Ballstrom here with us, who uh, will be giving the keynote um, address and will also receive uh, a Mayer Award for Global Citizenship. And she's joining us through the magic of uh, modern technology uh, all the way from Sweden. Um, so it's great to have her with us. And then now I would, of course, introduce uh, the president of uh, Tufts University, Tony Monaco, who um, is an accomplished uh, leader, um, scientist, and, and teacher. We all know him here at Tufts. A deep commitment to academic excellence um, and also a global perspective, which is central to what we do at IGL and also central to what the university uh, does. And uh, during this past two years, we've all been really impressed by the leadership that he's shown, a great competence and the great compassion with which he's led Tufts and, and the community. So I now turn it over to President Monaco to welcome uh, and to in. Well, thank you, after, uh, Abby, and good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to welcome you to the 37th Annual International EPIC Symposium. Welcome also to all of you who are joining remotely, including our featured speaker. While the last two EPIC Symposium were entirely virtual, this is the first hybrid symposium hosted since the start of the pandemic. Tufts Institute for Global Leadership offers unique opportunities for Tufts students to make a difference in the world. IGL combines intellectual rigor with experiential learning to prepare new generations of students who are critical thinkers and they can provide the effective and ethical leadership needed to address the world's most difficult challenges. The annual EPIC conference is just of one of many uh, IGL activities and initiatives. The conference builds off the Education for Public Inquiry and International Citizenship, otherwise known as EPIC, the hallmark course of IGL's program. It's a year-long multidisciplinary course based on a global theme. The theme of this year's symposium, Problems Without Passports, is especially timely and of fundamental importance. In a world that is becoming increasingly globalized and amid complex problems ranging from the pandemic to systemic racism to warfare, it is clear that global cooperation is needed to solve these international issues. It's an honor to have the Honorable Margot Wallström, former Foreign Minister of Sweden, as our keynote speaker. Minister Wallström's distinguished career as a public servant exemplifies what it means to be an active citizen and a global leader. There is truly no more fitting candidate to receive the Dr. Jean Mayer Global Citizenship Award. I look forward to hearing her keynote address shortly. Before we kick off the program, I would like to thank the Bendenson family for sponsoring the symposium and for their generous support for IGL. I'd also like to thank Dr. Abby Williams and his team uh, for organizing this event and bringing together such wonderful panelists and discussion leaders. Most importantly, I want to thank the EPIC students themselves for all the hard work designing this symposium that went through the entire year. It's really a tremendous accomplishment, and I'm confident that it will be a very memorable event. It's certainly one that I look forward to every spring. It's now my pleasure to turn over to Salome Diaprima, who will formally introduce our keynote speaker. Salome is a sophomore and current EPIC student from North Carolina, planning to major in international relations with a focus on globalization. She is involved with women in international relations as in, and is especially interested in the implementation of sustainable development goals 
across nations and the global south. Thank you. Hello everyone, so my name is Salome Dea Prima and I'm a member of this year's EPIC course focusing on problems without passports and I am the IGL liaison for women in international relations here at Tufts. The Dr. Jean Mayer Global Citizenship Award was established in 1993 to honor the life and legacy of Jean Mayer, the 10th president and first chancellor of Tufts University a world-renowned nutritionist publishing more than 750 scientific papers and 10 books, John Mayer advised three U.S. presidents, President Nixon, President Ford, and President Carter, the U.S. Congress, United Nations Food and Agricultural Organization, the World Health Organization, the United Nations Children's Fund, and the U.S. Secretary of State. He helped establish and expand the food stamp, school lunch, and other national and international nutrition programs, and organized the 1969 White House Conference on Food, Nutrition, and Health. In 1966, Dr. Mayer was the first scientist to speak out against the use of herbicides in the Vietnam War. In 1969, he led a mission to war-torn Biafra to assess health and nutrition conditions. In 1970, he organized an international symposium on famine, which produced the first comprehensive document on how nutrition and relief operations should be handled in a time of disaster, and was the first to suggest that using starvation as a political tool was a violation of human rights and should be outlawed. For his service in World War II, he was awarded 14 decorations, including three Croix de Guerre, the Resistance Medal, and the Cross of the Knight, of the Legion of Honor. Among his 23 honorary degrees and numerous awards, he was the recipient of the Presidential End Hunger Award, the President's Environment and Conservation Challenge Award, topics that we will be addressing in this weekend's symposium. As the 10th president of Tufts University, Dr. Mayer created the nation's first graduate school of nutrition, established New England's only veterinary school, and the USDA Human Nutrition Research Center on Aging at Tufts, and co-founded the Sackler School of Graduate Biomedical Sciences and the Center of Environmental Management. As chair of the New England Board of Higher Education, he created scholarships that enabled non-white South Africans to go to mixed-race universities and in their own country. Upon his death, the Glo Boston Globe wrote, Mayer moved universities as social institutions in new directions and towards the assumption of larger responsibilities. He saw them as instruments for improving society and the world environment. President Jimmy Carter said, Dr. Mayer's life and productive career has been dedicated to the service of mankind. In the spirit, the Meyer Award seeks to challenge and inspire students and the larger community by bringing Tufts distinguished scholars and practitioners of moral courage, personal integrity, and passion for scholarship, which has resonated in his dictum that scholarship, research, and teaching must be dedicated to solving the most pressing problems facing the world. I'm delighted to present the Honorable Margot Walsham with the Dr. Jean Mayer Global Citizenship Award this evening. Her fervent advocacy for feminist foreign policy and commitment to understanding the effects of the climate tr crisis, especially on building and maintaining peace, are deeply encouraging and inspiring. The Honorable Margot Walsham was elected to the Swedish Parliament in 1979, where she served as the Minister for Foreign for Youth, sorry, Youth, Women, and Consumer Affairs from 1988 to 1991, and the Minister of Culture from 1994 to 1996, and the Minister of Social Affairs from 1996 to 1998. In 1999, she served as the European Commissioner for the Environment and then as the first president of the European Commission from 2004 to 2010. In 2010, the former United Nations Secretary General Ban Ki-moon appointed her as the first special representative on the sexual violence in conflict, a position she held until 2012. The former Secretary General noted that during her time as a representative, she brought exceptional leadership to this issue, channeling the voices of survivors and victims into the Security Council and demanding greater accountability and justice at national and international levels, a testament to her steadfast commitment to these expansive global issues. She continued her advocacy during her appointment as Minister for Foreign Affairs of Sweden from 2014 to 2019 
While working as a minister for foreign affairs, she did not waver in her core feminist beliefs and did not stand down in face of difficult political situations. She continued her advocacy during her, sorry, more recently, she has been continuing her passions for human rights and her commitment to issues of climate crisis as the chair of the International Panel of Environment Peace Initiative at the Stockholm International Peace Research Institute. In her words, the destiny of others is also our destiny. Like never before, we need to focus on children, on the next generation, to establish long-term thinking and politics. And to do that, we need to work together. This afternoon, we honor the Honorable Margot Walsham with the Dr. Jean Mayer Global Citizenship Award in recognition of a lifetime of distinguished service to her country and the global community, and for her courageous commitment to solving problems without passports. So you have to tell me when <laughs> it's my turn. <laughs> Thank you so much. It's your turn, Margot. Can you see me? Is it my turn? That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> When at a university, I actually turn to the students first and say, dear students, dear president of the university, dear professors, dear, dear friends. Uh, and I am, of course, deeply honored and happy um, and I'm very pleased to, to be awarded. Um, uh, and also, I wish uh, so much that I could be with you in, in person and I hope that will be possible one day. I thank you so much. I was moved by, by your, your kind words and the fact that you are willing to, to give me time and you're willing to listen to me for a while. So um, you know that uh, I've been given the, the, the topic of talking about a world uh, between hope and despair, or I chose it myself. And I hope that there will be some hope left and not only despair. Actually, as a foreign minister, I, I used to tell the tale of the two wolves, and maybe you know it very well from before. This is about the, the grandfather and his grandchild talking about life. And the grandfather says, you know, life is like within every person there is a fight between two wolves. And the one wolf is uh, evil, jealous, arrogant, greedy, violent. And the other wolf is the one who is calm, generous, um, that is honest and, and loving. And after a while, of course, the grandchild asks, but grandfather, which wolf wins? And the old man says, the one you feed. So what wolf are we, are we feeding at the moment? I will have to start with the, the despair that the, the world feels at, at the moment. And we have not more than two hours by plane from where I am in, in Sweden. A war is raging again in Europe. A war that has already taken thousands of, of lives, um, that ha have sent millions of people fleeing, mostly women with children and has put cities in in ruins and it's like tacitus uh, said you know that they they uh, where they made a desert they called it peace 
It looks like a desert in some places already. To us, this has changed everything. Um, and I think it has created so much of sorrow because we can follow in real time the, the desperate situation and the suffering of people in Ukraine. And we feel it because they also come to our countries in, in Europe in the millions and they need, uh, they need help and shelter. They need everything at the moment. It has also created an anger against Putin um, and, and Russia that they can start a war like this, lying uh, in our faces about what they are doing. And we can also see that. We can also clearly follow that this course that they are trying to present to, to the world. And it has also uh, awoken a fear in people. Will war come to our part of, of Europe, our part of the, the world? Will this lead to a, a new Cold War that will last for a very, very long time? Uh, how do we protect ourselves? So like never before, do we now have preppers here as, as well, you know, they they store water and money and whatever they think is will be uh, important to sustain uh, life in a, in a war situation. Uh, and we are discussing NATO membership like our neighbor Finland that shares a very long border with, with Russia and no Russian violence and Russian war. Um, so this has, has turned everything upside down. Also in a situation where we felt we were on our way out of, of the pandemic, we were starting to, to breathe again and think that maybe we can uh, repair things uh, in our societies. Maybe we can have some, uh, get some resources to actually do all the reforms that we identified as necessary during the, the pandemic. But it is also, of course, in the end, um, I think that this, this war is an example of what denotes modern wars. And maybe you have already studied this, but what uh, experts say is that modern wars are, first of all, that they are fought through media. And that is absolutely true about this war that goes on in Ukraine. We, uh, we see that both sides use social media to present themselves as, as um, uh, winners of this war, uh, being victorious or, or losing out. Uh, so this is, this is clearly uh, uh, something that, that uh, denotes also this war. Secondly, modern wars, um, uh, they also take more civilian lives <clears throat> than, than uh, soldiers' lives. And they say that more people die from war than in battle. And um, that is also, we, we can count sort of the, the civilian victims in, in, in this war. And uh, uh, that comes from the fact that modern wars often the, have, has the lines between politics and military strategy has been blurred. And also the lines between warriors or soldiers and civilians. And this has put uh, women and children on the front lines of of wars, and this is not the first time we see that. We have seen it in, or we can see it in wars everywhere in, in the world. There are much fewer wars today about um, gaining te or winning territory, or taking territory. Uh, it's actually more about democracy, and you can say that what we see in Ukraine, both of these uh, things play out. It's about territory for for Russia is really fighting for democracy and to be able to decide their own future and their own destiny for the Ukrainians. 
Um, another thing that, that is typical for modern wars is, of course, the use of, of mo modern high-tech uh, weapons. Um, and um, uh, drones uh, have been used in a way that, uh, that is, is more common uh, now, nowadays. Um, but also the threat of using nuclear weapons. And I think another um, thing that, that is typical for modern wars has to do with how to define victory, that it is much more difficult to, to say that this is uh, being victorious, this is what, what victory uh, means, and we have really won this war. There are no winners in, in wars. Most of the time there are, there are no winners. We are all losers, and the things that we lose right now is, of course, that um, this is also a threat and an attack on what we've called the European security order, and also uh, how it will change uh, geopolitics and will affect all of us for probably a long time. Um, and uh, we also see that that um, the whole power balance or the the, the deterrence, uh, the principle of deterrence, is really not working as as it was intended. So uh, this is what happens. At the same time, as we have so many other uh, challenges and security risks. Um, we know that there is a, an, an ongoing and since some time back uh, a challenge to multilateralism. Um, there is a, a new era of strategic confrontation and, uh, and competition. The rules-based order and, and, of course, the Ukrainian, the war uh, that Russia is fighting against Ukraine is an example of, of that, uh, that the rules-based systems are ignored and, uh, and violated, uh, that humanitarian uh, law is also uh, under threat uh, in Yemen, Syria, and we have many other examples also lately and that the organizations and the bodies uh, that, uh, that are uh, the symbols and the, uh, the bodies of multilateralism, like the United Nations, uh, its authorities is undermined and challenged. And as a, uh, as, as a sign of the, the irony of, of destinies, of course, that uh, Russia was chairing the UN Security Council exactly the same month as, as they started a war in Europe again, a war against Ukraine. So of course the credibility of the United Nations will be put in, in question. So the, the, the challenges to the whole idea of seeing this as, a, as common challenges, common threats to, to our existence and, and our possibilities to survive on, on this planet. This is clear to, to everybody. But, and that includes then um, the climate crisis. And today it's not only climate change, it is a climate crisis. And we know already, uh, we have seen it now, we've felt it on our skins lately, as have, have you, uh, what happens when we have these extreme weather conditions. And the IPCC has mentioned this in, the, in consecutive reports, that you will see more of extreme weathers like violent storms, like uh, flooding, like forest fires, uh, and, and all of the, the things that also shape our, uh, our daily lives and cost a lot of sometimes lives, but, but also um, the loss of, of forests or, um, or material, uh, material things. So the climate crisis, we, we would need to focus on that. We, we have to invest in also creating new energy, sustainable energy systems and getting less dependent on, on fossil fuels. 
Um, and, and we know that that comes at the cost, but also brings a lot of, of uh, advantages. Um, and we have also learned about the interplay between peace and climate change. When there is no, no water or food, of course it can create and has already in many um, uh, war and conflict situations in the world. It first it creates social unrest and then this grows to to uh, conflicts between, for example, herders and, and farmers, and in the end it can lead to, to wars. Uh, um, and that is also, we, we've seen only the beginning of, of such things. Uh, we see big migration uh, flows and what do we do with, with people that have to leave their countries because of, of climate change, when with coastal erosion, with, with flooding, um, simply um, some parts of the world will be inhabitable. <clears throat> what we've also seen lately, and uh, I, I don't want to drag you down into a depression, but let me just list a few things and, and I will get to the hope side as, as well. But we've also seen uh, inequality on the rise. And, and this is also um, when, uh, you know, when we live in a situation where actually um, uh, eight people own, eight individuals own as much as 50% of the population on this planet. Uh, you start to think, what, what about uh, e equality? Can, what can we do with, with the, such uh, imbalance also? And, and the fact that many people see that they think that democracy has not brought uh, um, more of, of um, welfare or life chances or, or made the world uh, better. And, and that it also creates then a mistrust in political systems and, um, um, and they turn from, from uh, the, the trusting institutions or trusting media and uh, we have the polarization that we have seen, not only in, in your country, but in so many places around the world. Uh, the pandemics also have to do uh, with the loss of, of biodiversity, which is part of, of the, the climate crisis, because climate crisis also exacerbates these problems of, of loss of, of biodiversity. And um, not far away from here, we uh, keep two uh, beehives and uh, and very often uh, we have to, to tell people that without bees, you know, we wouldn't survive um, very long on this uh, planet either. So those small creatures are, are so uh, important. And uh, overall, um, a shrinking democratic space. For a long time, we were thinking that democracy would thrive more and more countries uh, were introducing elections and general elections and they were they were building institutions that that our democracies rest on but now we have seen for for more than 10 years we have seen a backlash for for democracy and more people today live in what we can call autocracies um, or the countries that, that are experiencing a, a backslide. Uh, uh, and this is, of course, very, very problematic because uh, we need, and you need, especially you students, need to, I think, write your own stories about why democracy is so important. Where, where do you turn if you don't um, know that somebody will listen to your complaints, that there are no free uh, press and, and media, that, um, that the laws uh, are applicable to, everybody has to, to, um, to abide to the, to the laws. What is it in, in a democratic society that we value the most and how do we keep democracy alive? And as if this was not enough, we've also seen in this uh, war situation in Ukraine that 
that President Putin has threatened to use nuclear weapons. And um, this is where Abidu uh, Williams and myself actually have met in a setting where we discussed um, um, weapons, weapon control and also uh, nuclear, nuclear weapons. And what has happened lately is that, first of all, we could see that the, the rhetoric about nuclear weapons changed and, and it was no longer um, used as, as a deterrence only um, and um, something that, that would help to keep sort of a, a, a power balance and deter from, from starting wars. But today, um, it's more of um, presenting it as something that can be used in the battlefield. So, of course, tactical, tactical nuclear weapons that are now modernized as well. So, um, also the nuclear weapon states that have signed up to, for example, the non-proliferation treaty, they have not lived up to their obligations. Uh, they have gone, they have done uh, the opposite and uh, they have invested in, in modernized uh, nuclear weapons. So this is um, uh, very, very serious as, as well. And of course, we know that there are other countries who, who would like to, to, um, um, to uh, start uh, using uh, nuclear weapons, or rather, starting start uh, producing uh, nuclear weapons, uh, North Korea, Iran, and and others. And it seems to be a, a race also against uh, against the more of uh, acquiring more of of nuclear weapons. And uh, of course, the more we see of this, the higher the risk is about for, for mistakes or miss, bad judgment um, that can lead to, to a catastrophe. So that's, that's the, the despair side or the, the things that can make you think, how will we, how will we survive? How can we avoid the next, uh, next pandemic to, to begin with, because you know that this was, uh, the COVID was another example of what is called a zoonosis. So it means that it is transmitted from animal to, to humans. And uh, most of the, the, um, the flus and the, the different di diseases that we've seen or the pandemics that we have experienced previously are of that uh, kind. Um, that they are transmitted by mosquitoes or the rats or the bats or what, whatever to, to human beings. And, and that in turn, we have to start to look at why, why is that? Um, yeah, because we have deforestation, we have desertification, we have uh, changed the habitats for these uh, creatures and these animals so that they come too close to people where they should not be, where they should not be eaten or, or sort of um, um, met with too, too closely. So, so this is also something that, uh, that we have to address if we want to stay uh, healthy and avoid to have another very deadly pandemic. But as I keep saying to my grandchildren, you know, the world is both, both, um, I, I don't know if I use the word horrible, but I, I, it's terrible, but it is also beautiful. It's a beautiful place. So where is the hope? The hope lies within us. Um, and I think like no other generation before us, uh, and we are different generations, but uh, let's say that we are, we work as one, like no other generation. Do we have the knowledge, we have the training, we have the technology, we have the resources, we have, we have uh, so many tools at our disposal and we can communicate, we can do mass communication and we can use it for, for the good. We have so many examples of where people also locally um, start to work um, against these problems. They deal with these problems. 
and they want to be reckoned with, they want to be heard, they want to play a part. And I think that this is, it is still possible, it is still possible also with climate change to do something about it. We have amazing examples of systems that are sustainable um, and that, that can, can switch um, our despair into hope. And it's like with the Pandora's box, when, when it was opened, everything flew out and, and, and left. And, uh, but the thing remaining in, in her box was uh, hope. Uh, and I, I think that maybe um, also to say something about uh, an aspect of all of this um, that, ha that has uh, engaged me for a, a very long time, uh, for many, many years now, it's also the role of women. Because I find it problematic that, that women are still discriminated against in so many situations. And I even dare to criticize those who actually sit down and, and call it a peace negotiation uh, between Ukraine and Russia because there are no women ar around the table. No women in Ukraine. Women make up a majority of the population. Women fight and die and suffer. They take care of children and the elderly. They had to flee. They experience also conflict-related sexual violence, rapes and the risk of being trafficked. And they love their country as much as men do. But why are they not around the table? Of course, women's voices have to be heard in all of these situations. Otherwise, we cannot make peace. More women means more peace, because as we've seen in so many uh, negotiations around the world, when women get a seat at the table, more options um, are, are there, are presented. And in Colombia, I remember that, that women um, insisted on being represented. And they uh, introduced new topics. They said, well, you cannot uh, create peace uh, if you don't do land reforms. And what do you do with those soldiers that uh, belong to, to FARC? What, what should we do with them? Unless you solve those problems, we will not get, uh, get peace. And I think that it's not that women are, are better than, than men, but they bring other um, perspectives, other experiences, and their knowledge as well. How can we not uh, use that potential of, of, of women. So to me, it was uh, necessary to introduce what I call the feminist foreign policy, looking after the rights and the representation of the, and the resources for, for women, because it belongs to foreign policy. Because I know, and the United Nations have, has proven that when women are part of peace negotiations, those peace deals and peace agreements last longer. They are also peacekeepers. They are also the ones who, who um, uh, make sure that, that, that uh, a peace can, can last, uh, last much longer. And I think that women in peace negotiations, it should be the default position, not an argument. And that's why we also have to look at that. And in the midst of the Ukrainian war, a Ukrainian woman fed a young Russian prisoner of war and let him use her telephone. And she said, call your mother. So I think that women are agents of change also on the front lines. They find another way. They use their experience and their lives as examples of what you, what you can do. And it's like in the, in the poem about the, the snail and the, the tanks, you know, that the snail actually uh, finds a way uh, around the burning city because it chooses the things that live. And it will, it will last longer, it will survive. That, uh, the snail, and I think friendship be between people. Thank you for listening to me.
Okay, uh, uh, Margot, thank you so much for that wonderful uh, talk and for raising so many important issues. Uh, we have an audience here in person um, at Tufts and we have two microphones set up. So I'm going to ask the students, I'm sure they have lots of questions to pose them uh, to you. And can you hear us? Can you hear me? Yeah, a little low. I'll a see if a I little can... low? Yeah, no, is it, I, is it, is it better now? Okay, it's okay. Great. I, I hear you. All right. And I forgot to say, can I, I, I forgot to say one thing, because really to, to, the, to the hope, I must say also that the, the resilience and the fight and the spirit of, of the Ukrainian people at the moment, we can see it reported every day. That's, that, that is also, and the solidarity and the compassion that has been shown by people in, in Poland receiving two million, more than two million people fleeing from. 